just before this interview begins, I'd just like to let you know that um, I'd started my audio capture software at the same time I plugged in my webcam for the interview with Dr. Holden. And unfortunately, the software changed the default microphone from this one I'm speaking to now to the one in the webcam, which is, of course, nowhere near as good. So the audio will be of much lower quality in this one than it has done pre than it has been previously. So I apologise for that. But the interview itself is certainly worth listening to. It's very interesting indeed from somebody that has a lot of knowledge and has done a lot of research in the field. So I hope you can forgive the lower quality of audio, but please enjoy this episode. So so what topics would you like to touch on? Well, the main interest, uh, having read your main section in um, the handbook of near-death mm -hmm. experiences, is veridical perception in out-of-body experiences and near-death experiences, because I think they are kind of the main objective empirical evidence we have in support which of course unfortunately is often overlooked as anecdotal and mm -hmm. people like to pick the stories apart to say, I mean, the, for example, the tennis shoe, mm -hmm. um, which is a famous one, people mm -hmm. have often said that you know, someone's gone back and sat in that room and they've found that they could have seen the, the tennis shoe from a certain location or when they're brought into the hospital, they could have seen it. And mm -hmm. what's the other one that's very... Pam Reynolds. Pam Reynolds, yeah, yeah. When, mm -hmm. when her brain was, was effectively frozen. Mm -hmm. um, and the it was the bone saw, wasn't it? The, the skull saw yes. that she saw, yeah. and uh, yeah, and also there's the man with the dentures mm -hmm. who, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Those are the three that have gotten, I think, the most play on mm. uh, in terms it's, of dialogue. It's those three, and it's the mm -hmm. the guy, I can't remember his name, but the doctor who was flapping his arms during operation. Oh, yes, that's right. Yes, uh -huh. yeah. Right, and right. unfortunately, a lot of people have picked them apart and convinced themselves and other people, especially these media um, skeptical mm -hmm. fellas. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be taken at a very, very underwhelmingly of importance. Mm -hmm. If that, that doesn't make sense, but you know what I'm trying to say. I do. Um, <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah. It's such an important thing. And mm. such, I think, an empirical and objective thing, but it's dismissed because it's it should be impossible. Right, right. And therefore, they, people try to find explanations which don't fit every situation, mm -hmm. I don't think. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that, the, for example, the critiques of Pam Reynolds um, are um, just um, um, wrong. You know, um, based on everything I know about, and I've studied her procedure really closely, and uh, the criticisms just don't hold water. So, um, but her, in her case, she actually was not yet in the standstill phase of the of the the um, procedure. Um, so first, they completely anesthetize the person, tape their eyes shut, put the speakers in their ears. One of them is um, emitting this loud pulsing about this the the um, the volume of a lawnmower, and the other is um, emitting la uh, loud white noise. So static, kind of, yeah, yeah, uh huh. And then they have to switch back and forth because if they just kept this one in a person's ear, it would make them deaf. So they switch the sounds back and forth over the course of the procedure. And they're using that to monitor brain activity. So they get her all completely anesthetized, eyes shut, ears plugged. And, um, and the next thing they do is uh, two things at once. They open the skull um, and they also, um, go down to the um, thigh region and hook the person up to the, um, the um, bypass machine. So blood is gonna be drained out of their body. And so that's the point at which she had her veridical, the veridical aspects of her experience where she heard the, um, the sound, as you said, of the bone saw, and which is what kind of uh, you know, subjectively from her point of view, pulled her out of her body. And she was over, back over the shoulder of the surgeon, lo lo 
her location, the location of her consciousness. And she heard a voice from down at the other end of the table, a woman saying, uh, the, the vein is too small. And then she heard her surgeon, who was the one holding the bone saw, say, try the other side. So what that surgeon down at the other end of the table was doing was preparing her to hook her up to the bypass machine. So like she was not in the in the standstill state. She was just fully anesthetized and fully instrumented at the time, which in my view doesn't, um, doesn't uh, detract from the evidence of, of the case. It's just that she was not in the condition where her brain was not functioning. At I mean, the thing is, you know, if, if it was, as people suggest, a case of um, awareness during anesthesia or inadequate yeah. anesthesia, the thing is, in order to hear that bone saw, even because they say, don't they, that um, she, she said it was like an electric toothbrush in appearance, which yeah. she could have determined by listening to it and understanding that, that that kind of thing is what you hear in a dentist kind of drill, and then they make it look like that in their mind, which fair enough, but it doesn't work because they say her ears were bombarded with this, was it 100 decibel or so? That's right. Uh, um, and her eyes were taped shut. Uh, mm -hmm. which I suppose wouldn't matter if she was able to kind of get an idea of what it may look like. Um, yeah. But the fact that she heard it at all with that stimuli, I mean, are we assuming that it was, it was a constant stimuli? There wasn't it breaks. Was. It was constant. Yeah. So right. that doesn't, that doesn't work. Right. And, and never in any of her, you know, she talked about this in about three different places and never did she make reference to hearing the sounds that were coming into her ears through the the um, speakers, the little speakers in her ears. She always talked about just hearing the conversation as if she were outside, you know, listening to the conversation. So I agree with you completely. So, yeah, so if there was any audible um, sound coming through her ears, she would have surely heard primarily the... Exactly. And it's the same, have you been keeping up with Dr. Parnia's uh, Aware 2 study? Uh, not not really closely because there's he uh do you, do you understand the premise of what he's doing oh yeah 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 I did so okay so that type. yeah so anyone that doesn't know just go and have a look but uh, essentially he's got an ipad um up above in an unviewable situation and he's got um headphones on those that are undergoing cardiac arrest playing audio audio stimuli um i think it was one person heard the audio stimuli during cardiac arrest in which sense there's no blood to the brain of course and therefore there shouldn't be consciousness yeah. um but the, that's not incredibly what was interesting to me the interesting thing was that one of them was able to hear a conversation going on outside mm -hmm. but they didn't notice the stimuli that was in in playing in their ears now the question is whether that was being constantly played or whether it was during a gap in which it wasn't played from what i'm aware it suggests that it was going constantly in which case why would they hear a conversation without hearing the audio stimuli unless they were outside of their body? Yeah, exactly. But we don't we don't know the full concept of that yet. Right, right. So we can't say one way or the other. But the Pam Reynolds case sounds very similar. Yeah. She she heard does. a conversation without hearing those those clicks. Yes, that's right. That's right. Mm. So yeah, and uh, now have you read this the book The Self Does Not Die? Not yet. That's okay. that's on the good. waiting list. <laughs> good, good. Well, it. I would I would put it at the top of your list if I were you, mm -hmm. because it is a compilation of over a hundred cases. We don't call them anecdotes; we call them cases of verified paranormal phenomena associated with near death experiences. And in addition to the um, the flapping wings. Um, one of my favorites is um, a woman is in surgery, um, completely anesthetized, unexpectedly flat lines. So of course the medical team scurries around and gets eventually gets her heart started again, finishes the surgery, takes her to post-op where she regains consciousness and her physician, her surgeon comes to check on her. And she says to him, I know that I died during the surgery. And he's like, how do you know that? Because nobody had informed her of that. And she said, well, I was up above the ceiling watching. And then she proceeded to describe everything that everybody did during the resuscitation, which 
amazed him. And, um, but she said, um, and like I said, I was above the ceiling. I could see through the ceiling and through the walls. And in the adjoining operating room, they were amputating a man's leg. And when they finished, they put the amputated leg in a yellow plastic bag to dispose of it. And this surgeon was just amazed because he said, um, I don't even know what's going on in the other operating rooms of the hospital. You know, I don't pay attention to that. So, and he had never been in that particular operating room because it was specialized for amputations, which he didn't do. But at this point, it was now a couple hours after the surgery. So he went back to the hospital records and he found that in fact, while he was doing the surgery on this woman, they were amputating a man's leg in the next operating room. And then he, um, that at that time, the room was empty. So he went to it and poked his head inside and there he saw the yellow plastic bags that they used to dispose of amputated body parts. So how could she possibly know? And it's not, as if she could read his mind, because he didn't know. Um, the only really viable explanation is that indeed her consciousness was out of her body and able to perceive through what we normally consider to be solid material mm -hmm. to what was happening. Unless, of course, she was able to pick up the, the mind of the, the operating doctor or some of the staff in the other room, for some reason she was able to pick those up telekinetically. Yeah. But so that, that, even that's suggestive of, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. So, How yeah. do you explain um, that using materialist science? Yeah. You know, I mean, so, yeah. unless unless there wasn't any, I mean, was there, as far as you know, any kind of glass windows between the rooms where she could have seen those? So no, completely. completely separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, materialistic explanations don't seem to function in that case, it's unless it was a very, very, very lucky guess or everyone involved is lying or deluded. Right. Yeah. Which, exactly. unfortunately, a lot of it comes down to in these explanations. Well, and, and that's why in the, in the chapter in the handbook, uh, for, for the chapter in the handbook, I did a study collecting every case that I could find in the literature. And, um, and I did find a few cases that contained some error, like where the person said that they saw something that was later verified as not accurate. But the, the number of cases with error was minuscule. It was less than five, less than 3%, I think. I can't remember exactly. Um, whereas all these other cases were verified as completely accurate. So the, the idea of lucky guesses, there's a phenomenon called the file drawer effect you know, where supposedly if somebody says that they saw something and it's later verified as not accurate, it just gets filed and nobody pays any attention. But, um, but when you have people um, purposely seeking out cases and looking for um, the, the nature of the verification, and just not finding many that involve error, um, it it really argues against either lucky guessing or the file drawer effect. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. what, what would you say when um, when I'm on Quora or I'm on forums or various other online places, and when you hear it in um, debates and things like that, people always say there has been no objectively verified out-of-body perceptions. It's never happened. Well, I mean, we've just been talking about that. <laughs> yeah. And and that I would say, I would tell them to go read The Self Does Not Die because it, it contains over 100 cases of verified paranormal phenomena. Mm. And so um, it's, you know, it, it includes all the cases we've talked about, plus many more that you've probably never heard of. Mm. Yeah. Or, and many more that have never been reported for fear of ridicule. Well, yeah, there, sure. there very well could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's, yeah. we can't say that because that's just speculating at this point. It is. Um, well, the, and um, I think an important point is that, uh, as Pim Van Lommel says in, um, in his book, uh, Consciousness Beyond Life, something that I said 
many years ago, which is that um, near-death experiences alone cannot provide evidence of an ongoing afterlife because none of the people who came back stayed for an ongoing afterlife. And so, uh, you know, it seems um, logical to assume that what people experienced is a glimpse into an ongoing afterlife, but we really don't know because from, from a purely scientific point of view, you know, we, we can't know. But uh, what Pim says in his book is that um, the question of the survival of consciousness after physical death and, and even the um, argument of consciousness prior to physical existence rests on a convergence of evidence from several phenomena that have been very well researched. In addition to near-death experiences, um, children who remember previous lives and um, uh, after-death communication and mediumship. And so, um, like, here are a couple of cases from uh, one is from mediumship and one is from after-death communication, both involving food. <laughs> and so um, the first one from mediumship comes from Suzanne Giesman. I don't know if you know, you know her, yeah. And uh, at the International Association for Near-Death Studies conference uh, two years ago, she told about this case. A young woman came to see her. The young, young woman's father had died and she wanted to connect with her father. So she was going to Suzanne as a medium. And <clears throat> at the very beginning, when Suzanne first sensed his presence, <clears throat> she said to the daughter, uh, he's showing me shrimp, you know, the crustacean, uh, shrimp. And did shrimp mean anything special in your relationship with them? And the daughter's like, no. And she's racking her brain and, and Suzanne says, he's being quite adamant about this shrimp. And the daughter's like, I don't know what to tell you. So Suzanne said, okay, well, we got the message. We don't know what it means. Let's just move on. So then Suzanne told her, you know, one thing after another that the daughter recognized. And the daughter left all high. And she went home and called her mother, still living, and said, you know, I just um, had this session with Suzanne. And, and I, I really believe that daddy was there. And she said, Suzanne said this and this and this and this. And then she said, oh, but you know, the weirdest thing, um, at the very beginning, Suzanne showed me, sh or she said that he was showing her shrimp and he was being quite adamant about these shrimp. And on the other end of the line, her mother went, ah. and the daughter said, well, what? <clears throat> and the mother said, yesterday, I went out into the garage and cleaned out the freezer in the garage. And when I got to the bottom, I found this bag of shrimp. I don't know how long it had been there. So I decided to take it in the house and boil up the shrimp. And my intention was to put it in containers and kind of use it over the next couple of weeks. But she said, I ate one of the shrimp and it tasted so good that I ate the whole bag. So what's interesting about this case is that sometimes the question comes up in mediumship, could the medium be reading the um, sitter's mind? But in this case, the sitter didn't know about the shrimp. It was something that had happened to her mother the previous day. And so, um, so again, the only really viable explanation is that this uh, disembodied consciousness of her father is still watching and caring about what his loved ones do. And I mean, the, the, only other, the only other possible explanation, which is very much reaching for straws, is that uh, this medium mentioned shrimp and it just so happened that something had happened the previous yes, day and she made the connection. It could, it, could be, it could be a coincidence, right? Could be, which is always possible, but it seems unlikely from exactly. anyone's common sense point of view, yeah. but certainly possible. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And um, this, this other case is a um, young man who is a psychotherapist here in the U.S. And he was uh, one day um, meditating and suddenly found himself 
um, sitting opposite his deceased grandmother. And, um, and he, he's like, Granny, I'm so happy to see you. You know, I love you and I miss you. And, and she said, I love you too. And he said, you know, I know that, that our conversation is real, but could you do something to show me that, to prove to me that this is real? And so she took him into the home of his parents where he had grown up, into the kitchen and was pointing to the pots and pans. And she said, ask them about squash and onions. And he was like, okay. So um, the, the experience ended and he regained normal consciousness and he went right to the phone. And he um, called his parents and, he, and his father answered the phone and he said, have y'all eaten squash and onions lately? And, and his dad said, oh yeah, we cooked up a mess of squash and onions earlier today and we ate them. And then he um, asked, asked to get his mom on the phone and, and said the same thing. And she, she confirmed the same thing. So um, again, you know, I don't know how often they eat squash and onions, um, but, um, uh, you know, aside from the, uh, possibility of an amazing coincidence, it appears again that this disembodied entity w knew what was happening in the lives of, mm. of their loved one. But as so, you say, unless they eat that sort of thing regularly, exactly. it, seems, it, it seems unusual that the, the spirit would bring that up as if it's something that happens all the time as proof. Right. Because what right. would that be exactly. proof of anything? Yeah. Um, and and that would be a good question for him. How often do they do they prepare squash and onions? Yeah. 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 So yeah. So but my impression is that it's not a common thing. It's something that they do very occasionally. Yeah. So so yeah. So um so the Pulling together, and then of course there's all the research on children who remember previous lives. The yeah. work of Ian Stevenson and Jim, Jim Tucker. Tucker. Yeah. yeah, and um, and again there are some, you know, there are a lot of cases either can't be verified or could be explained in some alternative way, but there are a number of cases that just defy explanation except the idea that the person's consciousness reincarnated. So taking the evidence from all of those things together, um, it points more um, um, confidently, I guess, toward the idea that consciousness is um, separate from the brain. Mm -hmm. And perhaps not not just that, but also that after death we seem to retain some form of in, independence or individuality. Yes, sort of personality. In mm. fact, I mean, um, I just did a study of um, counselors' transpersonal experiences and what effect it had on their um, on their practice of counseling. And uh, in the study, I asked counselors. Uh, to describe their most impactful experiences. And one case was to illustrate your point about retaining some sense of personality. Um, it's even kind of worse than that. There's, uh, there appears to be a lot of retention of ego and egoic you know, kinds of intentions. So this woman, this counselor was uh, a friend of hers had died a year before. And so at the one year anniversary, she and a group of friends were going to get together and have a kind of memorial celebration. So she was at the store the day before buying um, paper plates and napkins and things. And she bought, um, she had picked up these pink plates and she was on her way to the cash register. And she distinctly heard the deceased person say to her, put those pink plates back, um, it's going to look like a damn baby shower. And so she like, okay. So she turned around and she put the put pink back. plates back and she picked some white plates up. And, and, um, and the next day, the other person who brought plates brought light blue. 
So she said, indeed, it would have looked like a ridiculous baby shower with pink and blue plates, you know? And so um, like really, like when we're disembodied, we're concerned about how our memorial service looks. looks you know? yeah. But um, but that's the that's the um, the the flavor that I get from many. Um, well, and even the you know people uh, you know if if indeed people watch what we're eating, you know the, our shrimp and our squash and onions, like really. Um, but that's what appears to be the nature, mm. at least for some people. Um, yeah. and it appears to be. It appears to be more so for those that have, have died, either young or unexpectedly, that are still very much connected. They haven't had that chance to kind of disassociate themselves with physical life on a gradual death. It's been a kind of accident or very short-lived yeah. illness. Um, I'm. I'm not sure about that. I know that in the uh, research on people who remember previous lives, there is a high percentage of people who um, died a violent, a sudden violent death, who um, uh, remember their previous life. Um, but like in the case of the, uh, the, the shrimp, this was an elderly father who had not died suddenly. Um, and in the case of the squash and onions, it was an elderly grandmother who had not died suddenly. So, um, so I don't know. I, my, my impression is that, that there are levels of consciousness beyond physical existence and the kind of, um, lowest level, and I don't mean that to denigrate it, but just to, you know, relatively speaking, the lowest level, the, the disembodied consciousness is still very connected to the material world and to the, to loved ones and all, and all of that. And that I think that um, some people sooner or later ad advance, I guess I'm going to use the word to higher levels of consciousness in that are less and less connected to the material world. And um, even in near-death experiences, there are a couple of cases of people who, uh, in their near-death experience, as, when they encountered the being of light, they um, either began to dissolve into the being of light and lose their sense of, you know, agency. Or in one case, the person actually did completely dissolve and then and then reemerged as his separate self. So there's it's not like it's just a one way trip um, uh, uh, based on his one, you know, an N of one. <laughs> yeah. So, so it yeah. seems to depend on the level of spiritual maybe advancement and evolution during the physical life that determines that maybe even after. That's my that's yeah. my impression, yeah. And that was written about a lot by um, Dr. Newton in his mm -hmm. Life After Life books. Right. Not Life After Life, 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 Life Between, Between Lives. lives. Right, yeah. right. Yes, exactly right, yeah. Mm. So, um, so that speaks to the importance in life, you know, going back to veridical perception and all that, in in my thinking, the the important point about near death experiences and all of this is um, what does this tell us about what's important in life? Like how sh how then shall we live? And you know what near death experiencers say is that. We're here to advance in our capacity to love, which is about spiritual development. And, and we're also here to learn, to acquire knowledge that somehow that is helpful um, to consciousness at large. Um, so it's about loving and learning. For me, veridical perception is the, the purpose of of studying veridical perception is to lend credibility to near-death experiences so that the message comes through about how to live. You know, that we don't need to fear death. Um, we, 
We might reasonably fear the dying process because it can involve suffering, but death itself is, as I've heard several near-death experiencers say, that the transition from living to dying is like walking from this room into the next. It's just that natural. Um, and that while we're here alive, our, um, our number one task is to advance in our capacity to love. And, um, and that then, um, and, and some of that has to do with not prioritizing material possessions, prioritizing people and relationships, and, and that non-attachment that also is addressed in Buddhism is, you know, part of, part of that process. And it's not that we're not meant to, because NDE years also say we're meant to enjoy the material world. That's, that's a big reason why we're here. And we're also, um, it's, it seems paradoxical to enjoy it and, and also not be attached to it. So that when we disembody, we're able to uh, to um, disconnect and experience higher levels of consciousness. So it's almost like we're simply playing a role while we're here, and therefore enjoying what we can while we're here, but mm -hmm. not not being identified as that character that we're playing. Exactly, uh, a lot like being a student, you know, and. Uh, we were all students at some time in, in the Western world anyway, and, uh, and we completely filled those roles and got all involved in them and, and played them out. And then we graduated and we're not students anymore, you know, in, in, at least in the um, official educational system. Uh -huh. but, but in a sense, we're all students of love. Students, students in the nature of life, essentially. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I think um, that. Do you think as well that applies to the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, and everything else that we determine to be alive? Um, so I know the, yeah. the theory of panpsychism that extends to the image, um, the um, insentient beings as well, rocks and plant and the the sun yeah. and what have you. So, yeah. um, do you think that yeah. that kind of I do. I, I think that consciousness pervades everything and that everything manifests consciousness to some degree. And, you know, a rock manifests a lot less consciousness than a plant and a person manifests more than a plant, you know, so it it's in, you know, degrees of consciousness. But absolutely, I believe that all living things have consciousness. Mm -hmm. But yeah. not necessarily sentience or self awareness. Yeah, exactly. Not not necessarily self awareness. Mm. Yeah. Do you, do you think um, creatures like dogs, cats, whales, pandas have a level of self awareness? Do you think they're evolved to that level of, of, of consciousness? I don't know. No. I, I just don't know. Mm. Um, I I think that. A, um, a really fundamental motive with which living beings are endowed is the avoidance of pain. And so um, it's hard to know whether a particular kind of behavior reflects, you know, something like the avoidance of pain, the seeking of pleasure, which doesn't require self-awareness. Yeah or whether there's actually self-awareness there. I just, I just I mean, really the, don't know. The reason I bring it up is because that's often stated as, a, a, as evidential that therefore, because the creatures have smaller brains or less developed brains, that they don't have the ability to develop self-awareness, and therefore that suggests that consciousness is brain-based entirely. That doesn't make any sense to me, because um, if the brain serves as a filter of consciousness, then there are different kinds of there are different degrees of filters. A smaller brain is like a thicker filter, or it's a 
it doesn't allow yeah. as much limited in exactly mm. yeah and i think that's the case for a lot of lines of evidence of emergent consciousness if you damage the brain you damage consciousness if you cut certain um connections you lose memories but mm. that also works mm -hmm. from an external consciousness point of view if the brain filters that because you cut the connections which allows the access to those memories exactly and, yeah so i don't understand how we can say def definitively that this suggests emergence because it could also equally suggest it's just that we don't have that mechanism as to where consciousness is if not within the brain yet that's right yet being and, the main word and this is where another line of evidence uh, plays an important role and that's the phenomenon of terminal lucidity and where people whose brains are damaged um, manifest complete lucidity sh usually shortly before death within the first uh, within a few days of dying um, someone who's had alzheimer's and is institutionalized and and uh, can't even feed themselves um, might in the hours before their death suddenly become lucid and converse with their loved ones about the family and things that happened like last week. Like how's Jane's new baby, you know, that just was born last week, indicating that, that despite the brain's inability to um, function normally, consciousness continues to um, exist and to perceive and remember and, and so forth. And it seems incredibly counterintuitive to assume that when the brain's damaged to that extent, just because we're approaching death, it then somehow rebuilds the ability to right. do this. And yeah. I, although I don't think any studies have been done to monitor the brain because it wouldn't be moral to do so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, if 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 you say you take the example of you said of Jane's new baby, um, if that was told to this person during non-lucid moments when the dementia was ravenous right. and therefore they didn't have the ability to create those memories if the memories are created in the brain they didn't have the ability to do that right. then how would she then know when lucid about what was told while she wasn't lucid because the memory shouldn't have been created then exactly. it shouldn't exist yeah so yeah. that doesn't work although this is incredibly rare isn't it terminal lucidity well um i think uh it's uh, actually, I think that it's more common than than has been documented. The documentation has been relatively rare, but uh, I've talked with several nurses who work in hospice, and when I talk to them about all these kinds of things like people seeing deceased loved ones shortly before their death and terminal lucidity, they're just like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I see that all the time. So. Um, so it's terminal lucidity in particular is something that really needs to be um, studied on a on a broad scale, like the like uh, the veridical perception studies that have been done in hospitals. Mm. You know, we need to do more of that because it's another aspect that shouldn't happen but exactly. does under our current physical understandings. Uh, another example of that, I think, if I draw to Penny Sartori's study is um one of our patients who had who had cerebral palsy mm -hmm. you know you know this um yeah. and he was for those that don't know he was in that situation with his tendons being so tight that he was unable to move that arm from i think it was from birth or from a very young age yeah. yes. uh, he had a near-death experience while he was clinically dead after that he had not complete movement but Much movement mm -hmm. which um in cerebral palsy the part of the brain that controls that tension doesn't function so it can't uh, but after that he was able to which suggests that there was some change either in the brain um, or in some mechanism we don't know that allows that to happen or there was some kind of you know, um, extra um, consciousness based healing that took place mm -hmm. which again in physical situations of that shouldn't happen mm -hmm. exactly right right mm -hmm. yeah very evidential it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, something else I wanted to talk about, something I saw recently on the, uh, is it the Virginia um, 
sector of the Virginia University that studies okay. where Jim, Jim Tucker perceptual okay. studies yeah. the um, um, that's it yeah, yeah the division of perceptual studies um they or Bruce Grayson produced a report that showed the similarities between near-death experiences and hallucinogenic drugs such as ketamine and dimethyltryptamine um, and he found that there was a very, very close connection between especially ketamine experiences and near-death experiences, which I'm sure people have jumped on to say that, therefore, that's some cocktail of these drugs which is taking place to produce these experiences. Um, so I just wanted to touch on that. I don't know very much about ketamine, and I don't know whether it's produced naturally in the in the body, um, but that's the that would be... One of my questions is, um, does it occur naturally in in the body? Um, so, you know, I, I know, I, I know dimethyltryptamine DMT is theorized to be produced in the brain, theorized. isn't it? Yes. Uh -huh. But, but DMT, yeah. I do know a good deal about DMT. And um, in th those experiences, people have, um, it's very common for people to have clowns and circus and alien imagery and none of i've never heard a near-death experience that included those things no. so um so you know there there may be some similarities but not um it it doesn't it doesn't it's not a perfect match no. um, which i suppose is, is one reason to say that maybe dimethyltryptamine is in play but it's combined with other drugs which are released at the time of death Possibly, but if DMT um, typically provokes particular imagery that we never see in an NDE, it's hard for me to believe that DMT could be uh, an important factor in yeah. it. So, and also, you know, if if it if it is a hundred percent drug induced, this mm -hmm. again still doesn't explain the veridical perception that people have. Exactly. Because exactly. hallucinations, you can always wake up. I've never had one, but from anecdotal evidence I've seen, you can only ever wake up from a hallucinogenic experience and realize that it was hallucinogenic. Right. Yes. Uh, right. I mean, there are cases in, in dimethyltryptamine where they say that it was more real than real, mm -hmm. um, which mm -hmm. is often accounted for in near-death experiences. But these mm -hmm. other drugs are very, very sporadic, it seems. Yeah. And I yeah, not very lucid at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. as, as you say, to create that level of extended awareness that people say in out-of-body experiences it's more real than real, you would mm -hmm. have thought that therefore dimethyltryptamine must be somewhere in there because mm -hmm. that's the only drug I know of that produces that sort of feeling other than well, there's maybe some in LSD and things like that, but generally. Psilocybin, yeah. Psilocybin. But mm -hmm. the other experiences within those drugs doesn't seem to be present. So yeah. how can you, if it's drug related, how can you have some aspects of that drug, but not many of the others? Right. It's, right. Yeah, it's quite, it's very strange. It but is. Again, these are rough ex um, explanations of people that haven't really deeply looked into the subject. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I agree. Mm. And I'm, um, I'm searching now to try to find a, an analogy where... So, for example, I, I don't know whether this is going to do it. I'm thinking out loud here. But um, let's say that I uh, extend my hand, my, the fingers of my hand, and I'm doing that, you know, by will. Like, I'm going to do it right now, and I'm not going to do it now. You know, I'm going to do it now. You know, and so it's, it's definitely my will that's making this happen. Well, if you... Um, opened up my head and stimulated the right part of my brain, you could get me to do this, uh, you know, but it doesn't mean that, um, that my will is not involved, my consciousness, my intention, when I inten intentionally do this. And so, um, you know, the search for these, the physical mechanisms of these things, um, is uh, it might in part account for 
some of the experience, but it really doesn't account for the real experience, yeah. you know, in which there is conscious intention or conscious. I, I think that's the basis of a hard problem, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You, you can, as you say, you stimulate the brain to do that, but mm-hmm. it's finding the initial will, the location of the initial will to make you want to do yeah. that. For whatever exactly. reason. A, lot, a lot of it's very, you know, um, in, instinctive. You, you go to pick up something, you, you move your leg or you walk or whatever, and you're not really thinking about doing it, you're just mm-hmm. doing it. But there is a, there is definitely occasions where there is a will to do it, um, especially during meditation when you're very aware of everything you're doing, mm-hmm. and you have the consciousness of actually of doing it with the will to do it, yeah. rather than just mechanically. And it's yeah. finding that the mechanism for that, which is mm-hmm. which hasn't happened, and I don't think. Mm-hmm. I mean, if it does, it will be a long time from now because we know we know so little about the brain. I agree. And. Yeah. You know, it, but to me, it just doesn't seem to fit that there would be any material basis for mm-hmm. how uh, various connections of neurons with an electrical impulse running through them creating chemicals. How mm-hmm. can you have some immaterial phenomenon such as awareness that comes from that? Because mm-hmm. these chemicals, these electrons, or the cells that, um, or the particles that create these electrons, aren't conscious as far as we're aware in our Mm -hmm. current paradigm, aren't Mm -hmm. conscious to begin with. So how can having multiple of those together with Mm -hmm. an electric charge, which is also these unconscious particles, how can they suddenly create attentiveness from something Mm -hmm. that isn't consciousness in their fundamentals? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't. Well, and, and I think, too, of even the process of vision, like how can all these... Um, neurons and things create the experience of a vision um, you know it's it's a similar kind of problem now on the other hand I think it's also fair to say that um, if one is going to consider the hypothesis that consciousness and the brain are essentially separate but closely related during physical life the question of how consciousness and the brain get related like what is the mechanism of that that's equally problematic as it's like the other hard problem it you is. know yeah and it's and, also the, the dilemma of having to demonstrate how consciousness could exist in an external form because we can't mm-hmm. have we don't have that mechanism that's a subjective thing which mm-hmm. Uh, as of yet we don't have the tools to measure right so yeah. therefore it's dismissed outright unfortunately mm-hmm. by many yeah exactly yeah very so, much as radio waves were in the 1600s mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah so yeah so those are kind of the the cutting edge of of this whole this whole thing but All that being said, despite the problems of not being able to explain how the mechanism works, um, the empirical evidence, I believe, um, definitely weighs on the side that that consciousness is um, essentially independent and um, that... um, that when when we have things like veridical perception, um, it it indicates that that consciousness it exists um, even when our physical processes are not working. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Could it be? It seems unlikely to me, but could it be that especially during near death experiences in cardiac arrest, when the um, EEG is flat. Um, could it be that perhaps there is some very deep brain activity going on that could facilitate a conscious experience that we don't have the ability to measure yet? To me, it seems unlikely because we must, have, at this point, have a very good understanding of what level the brain must be operating at to create a ex- uh, conscious experience. Right. But it's commonly said that we just there, there is activity going on in the brain, we just mm-hmm. can't measure it. 
But if there is at such a small level that we can't measure it, does could that possibly facilitate a conscious experience? I mean, to me, yeah. it doesn't. But no, I mean, I, I no. it doesn't make sense that if we're anesthetized, you know, our brain is at a low level. We don't remember what happened. If it's completely inoperative in terms of no blood flow and cardiologists tell us within about 20 seconds all measurable activity is gone it doesn't make sense that then you would have lucid complex experience under those circumstances even even if there were vestiges of brain activity of yeah. cellular activity and it, as you say it's not even just a conscious experience it's a heightened conscious experience that right. seems more real and more attentive than normal exactly and that generates veridical perception yeah so it just you know it, it mm. just kind of is so um, so what about the argument that these veridical perceptions even though they shouldn't exist to begin with but if they do happen uh, and general non veridical non near death experiences happen not when the EEG is flat and there's no measurable brain activity, but instead at the moment leading up to that state or the moment coming out of that state. Has well, there been any, think, any timed? N- not, not to my knowledge, uh, physically timed. I mean, when Bruce Grayson and I did one of the veridical perception studies uh, with people who were getting. Um, pacemakers implanted, and they have to stop the heart twice, um, once to make sure that the pacemaker is the the correct remedy, and then again after the pacemaker is implanted to make sure that the pacemaker will start the heart again. And so we thought this is perfect to to capture near-death experiences, and we used a a laptop uh, that was um, duct taped Uh, above the monitor in the operating room. So it was facing the ceiling and it was, uh, we programmed it to randomly play a little 20 minute, 20 second cartoon intermittent with the replaying of the cartoon was, uh, it's saying the time is now 12.01 PM. You know, the time is now 12.02 PM. So that if a person had an, uh, what I call the material aspect of their NDE, their consciousness is they perceive their consciousness to be outside their body, looking down and they see this and that, that we'd be able to align the time of the vision with um, the, you know, from their, through their consciousness with the time of the actual um, record of when they stop the person's heart. Um, but unfortunately, we um, we had 25 patients, so there were 50 cardiac arrest events, and no um, nobody had uh, the material. Well, one person had a material experience, except their consciousness wasn't near the near the laptop. So we tried to capture it, but to my knowledge, no one has captured it. Um, the The question is, like again, let's go back to the woman who saw the leg amputation in the next room. What does it matter whether she perceived it as she was going into cardiac arrest during car? I mean, from her subjective perception, she experienced it while she was in cardiac arrest. But what what difference does it make before, during? I mean, you, it doesn't matter. That's she it. saw Regardless, something. Regardless, it shouldn't happen. Right, mm. it just shouldn't happen. Shouldn't happen at all. Even if the brain's fully working, it shouldn't happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say something. I've completely forgotten what it was. <coughs> we were talking about right. So yeah. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's fuel for the for the scepticism that no study as of yet has has supplied objective evidence that people have been able to see these these um, these targets. So I know right. Dr. Penny Sartori's prospective study, none of them saw none of them saw anything. I think as of right now, nobody in the aware two study has seen that the uh, the iPad, regardless of that they heard the conversation, regardless uh, despite the audio stimuli. Mm-hmm. And I think there have been other studies that have proved no results. So that fuels mm-hmm. the skepticism mm-hmm. of the objective reality of these. Yeah. And so, uh- 
and I, I, I understand that, that argument. Um, <clears throat> when we've, um, cause I did the first of those studies back in 1995 at, um, a hospital in Illinois. And, um, since then, of course, I've, and I've done another, I did another study with Bruce, as I mentioned. Um, and so we've, uh, asked near-death experiencers, you know, what, to help us understand why we may have gotten, why we got the results we did. <clears throat> and they say that when they're out of their bodies, they're generally not concerned with things like what's showing on an iPad or, you know, that sort of thing. It's not that people don't see unusual things, like one woman was up um, above her body and, and she was right near the lamp that was over the operating table. And she noticed how much dust was on it. And she said something to the nurses afterwards, you know, that um, that that lamp up there is really dirty for being in an operating room. That's it, well, you wouldn't expect it in that sort of setting. You wouldn't would you? expect no. it. And, um, and, but uh, the point being that she was looking at something kind of extraneous, but cleanliness was important to her. And so it's finding things that are important to people. I'm about to, I'm editor of the Journal of Near-Death Studies and I'm, uh, the summer 2019 issue is about to come out a little late, it's November. Um, and the main article is by Jean-Pierre Jourdain who is a, uh, the head of INS France. And he did, did a study, um, asking near-death experiencers about the nature of their perception during the material aspect when they were um, perceiving the material world. And, um, and he ends, and, and he got some really interesting, uh, you know, many accounts in which people said things like, I was seeing everything at once. Um, I was seeing, in every direction at once, not, not meaning like this, but they were seeing everything from every direction at once. 360 degree vision. Yes, but yeah. 360 doesn't, I don't know how to, it's um, omnivision because it's like they're also seeing over here looking this way. It's not just the, you know, 360. Oh, right. I see. So they're, yeah. they're seeing from as if they were in different positions as well. Exactly. And, and so they, they said things like, you know, so I could see the front, the side, and the back of the, of the couch all at the same time. I can't even imagine what that must be like. I know. <laughs> it's really, and, and one of the things Jean-Pierre says is that the first time somebody described this to him, he couldn't, he couldn't, conceptualize it. rock yeah what, yeah what they were saying yeah. until he started hearing numerous accounts and then realized that you know it's it's the very definition of non-local consciousness that it isn't localized and not in one sp spot looking out i am everywhere perceiving everything anyway so at the end of his article he addresses this issue and, uh, and one of the things that people say is that they could see through solid objects. So he has the idea of use, putting something in an envelope and having it, you know, then they could see through it. Well, my idea is even more um, specific, and that is to ask people prior to a, um, prior to surgery of any kind to bring, um, six photographs that they can that they consider to be emotionally important to them and then put them in envelopes and and put them around the the room and of course um if we do six and we put them in identical envelopes um and then mix them up and then number them uh on the on the bottom and just place them around, then we don't know which which photograph is where. And if they then would notice the photograph because it has meaning to them, emotional meaning, um, and they say, yeah, over on this um, cabinet 
was this particular photo. And then we collect all the photos and of course make note of which one was where, and that's the one that was there. That that kind of thing would be more evidential. Mm. But so, that would be a double blind study as well, wouldn't it? It would be double blind, exactly, mm. yeah. Because we wouldn't know which photograph mm. was in which envelope in which location. No. So that would rule out any kind of objective um not like inference. the have been reading our minds. Have done that. You couldn't have right. subconsciously or accidentally suggested any particular envelope to them because you wouldn't know yourself. Right. So, yeah, so that rules out both of those possibilities as well. Yeah, exactly. Mm. But so, I know, unfortunately, there's not much funding in this area for studies such as this. There really isn't. So it, would be, it would be wonderful if we had a, you know, the... Um, Division of Perceptual Studies, um, the position that Bruce Grayson held was funded by the former president of Xerox and who was very interested in paranormal phenomena. And um, we really need a donor like that to- yeah. to You need a private investor for it. Kind of research, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So why do you think despite all this evidence, um, it's often seen as anecdotal and not important, and it's disregarded by the general scientific community. I, I divide people into three categories. There are people who've had these experiences, so they don't need evidence because they know from experience. There are people who, on the other extreme, have not had these experiences, and no amount of evidence is going to convince them. And there have been some interesting anecdotes about people, scientists who've um, presented the data to other scientists and the other scientists say, I just don't believe it. And, and, the, and the presenter would say, you know, well, tell me wh why. And they, and they say things like, um, I can't afford to revamp my worldview. You know, I just don't want to do it. And so, so there are people who, for whom no amount of evidence is going to make a difference. And then there is a group in the middle who are, may or may not have had some experiences, um, but even if they haven't, they're open to the evidence. And when they really look at the evidence, they see the, the weight of it um, and, and are influenced. Um, and those are the people to whom I direct my work. You know, people who are open to really genuinely examining the evidence um, and um, considering all the things we've talked about, you know, the possibility of, you know, chance and, um, and other mat material explanations, but, but conclude that based on the totality of the evidence, no, theory, no phenomenon accounts for all the evidence except the, the theory that consciousness is mm -hmm. independent of the brain. So to people who are very, very skeptical, I just don't say anything because there's nothing I can say that mm -hmm. will influence them. And it happens on the other side of the fence as well. You've got the very scientific materialist um, skeptics but you've also got those who believe completely that we survive death especially in the religious circles and things like that and that no amount of evidence the other way will suggest that maybe there isn't so you've got to be open to the possibility that there is and that there isn't both are Absolutely. possible Absolutely. You, yeah, as soon as you put all your eggs in one basket and you're fixed you you miss the idea of science so Absolutely. i don't think science isn't about understanding the material world it's about understanding the world whatever it is mm -hmm. yeah and it's 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 the practice it seems that science has very much become an ideology recently mm -hmm. instead of what it should be which is a process exactly ongoing and changing yeah absolutely right and i saw an account of um do you, do you know much about Dr. Rupert Sheldrake? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, I saw him at the, at, the, at the Beyond the Brain Conference, yeah. yeah. I'd, I'd love to have a chat with him, but he's, he's yeah. busy promoting his book and things, so it's fair enough. Yeah. Um, but he was one of the few that actually got back to me, which I appreciate. But he mm -hmm. he and Dr. Peter Fennick did a 
a talk somewhere, I can't remember where, but they were instantly shut down and you know deemed pseudoscientific, I hate that word, pseudoscientific, yeah. woo-woo yeah. is another one I hate. Yeah. And they were, they were called all this and effectively I think they were kicked out. Yeah. And it was a serious scientific conference. Yeah. And he also got the TED talk that he was banned from. Or, yeah. or, it wasn't banned, it was put somewhere else, wasn't it? Mm. Um, and he, listening to the guy, he's incredibly intelligent. And yes. I would trust that he's done this research on um, yeah. what's the famous one? Uh, the dogs. Dogs that know when their owners you know, are. Yeah. Out. The one yeah. that James Randi was notoriously not completely honest about. Mm. Um, and who, who was this, the other guy? Is the other conjurer that oh, actually replicated yeah. his his findings? Yeah, uh, I can't I, remember. I know who you mean. Yeah, things like that, and yet he's still not taken seriously because psychokinesis and things like that just can't happen. It's impossible. Yeah, yeah. right. But it does apparently. It you know. does. Yes, yeah, apparently it does. it does. Unless his his research was completely flawed and completely stupid, why would you mm -hmm. completely disregard it? Yeah, exactly. And that seems to be the same thing with near-death research and out-of-body research. It's just mm -hmm. seen as impossible, can't happen. Mm -hmm. And anyone that preaches it are charlatans after your money, wishful thinking, childish thinkers. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, there are people like that, the yeah. false That's mediums right. and things like that. But That's right. you've got to be open to both and mm -hmm. fairly judgmental of the evidence. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. So um, one of the models that I find really helpful in this regard is um, the reflective judgment theory. And um, these researchers, um, King and I'll think of the other person's name, um, have studied how people come to positions on uh, complex issues that can't just be resolved through reason. So questions like, you know, is abortion right or wrong? And, um, and does consciousness survive, you know, physical death? And what they found is that uh, people move through three general phases. There are subgroups within these phases, but the three general phases are first pre-reflective um, judgment. And that's where the person has listened to an authority, whether it's a person or a book, or maybe a group of them, and, and adopts that position without questioning. And they tend to be quite adamant and, um, and um, vehement in their yes. position. That no, they're right. No, no, I think is the argument argument from authority or something like that. It's known as yes, the, exactly, yeah. exactly. Then the next level is um, where the person has begun to examine evidence and sees the validity of various points of view. And so they've left that authoritarian kind of position and they're now in a, a position of relativism that, oh, this has merit and this has merit. And this has merit. And so, um, but they haven't yet privileged at the data in terms of, um, of, of all the meritorious points, which are more meritorious. So they tend to be stuck in a mire of relativism. You know, everything is right. There's no, there's no answer. Um, and then the Third, and as far as they've seen so far, final phase is what I call, and um, the second phase is called quasi reflective. So there's pre reflective, quasi reflective, and then reflective judgment, where the person has really examined all the evidence and they've come to a current best answer. Now, it's not, it, they don't hold it with the vehemence that somebody in pre reflective but they hold it with um, commitment and a certain degree of confidence and also ongoing openness to additional evidence that may in eventually lead them to change their mind and come to a different current best answer. And those sort of people are called scientists. Yes, <laughs> it, right. When they're truly scientists, 
scientific and not scientistic. Mm, that's right. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah. Something else I wanted to touch on. Um, when you mentioned about um, classing people as experiences, um, non experiences, and cynics, or wasn't the words you used, but basically yeah. that reminded me. Um, so, how about those experiences that um, in cardiac arrest or any other near death episode um, who simply lose consciousness, then reawaken with nothing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why do you think that's the case? Well, there, I see several possibilities. We do know cases where people had delayed memory of their NDE. For some reason, they didn't remember it until something happened sometimes years later that suddenly triggers the memory and it all comes flooding back to them. Why it gets blocked for them, I, I don't know. And, um, um, and it's possible, you know, this is just, this is not a scientific hypothesis. It's just a personal um, belief that people get the experience that they need for their uh, spiritual development. And some people don't need to have an NDE or they might be so um, hard hearted, so to speak, that it, it wouldn't penetrate their consciousness they just wave it uh, away they would wave it away uh-huh um, and it, it seems strange that that sort of person wouldn't have an experience because then surely that would kind of more deeply root them in that belief i would say that again it, it seems un- it seems well, not unlike it seems strange that it, um if that is the case and having this experience would simply not help because they're so set in their ways well, that if they well, don't have one yeah if they don't it, it may, if they don't have one, I would have thought that might even push them further into that confidence that that's that it's not true. It may, yeah. it may, you know. I like, um, there's a there's a funny anecdote from um, I uh, a psychologist in the Chicago area has developed a a psychotherapy technique to facilitate people to have who are grieving to have after death communication with the person they're grieving. And I just completed a study at the University of North Texas, a randomized controlled study showing that people who went through that counseling had significantly greater relief from their grief than people who went through traditional talk therapy for grief. So anyway, um, this the guy in Chicago, his name is Al Botkin. And um, he was, work, after he'd been doing this work for a few years, uh, one of the things that we've noticed is that about maybe 70% of clients who want to have this experience have it. And about 25 to 30% don't. And in most cases, we have an idea why they don't, and it has to do with that they're in some kind of emotional turmoil that's that's blocking them from having the openness to have the communication. But there are some cases where we can't figure out why the person isn't having it, having the experience. So one day, Al was working with a client whose brother had died, and Um, And this um, guy, the client, had uh, quite a facility to have extended conversations with his deceased brother. And they were in like the third counseling session. And there was about 10 minutes left and they'd finished really what they wanted to do for the day. And Al said, you know, we have a few minutes left in our session and and, um, is there anything else you want to bring up? And the guy's like, no. And Al said, well, I... I've been doing this work for a few years and I'd really love to um, ask your brother some questions that maybe he can answer. And he, so they did the procedure and the guy closed his eyes and he says, yeah, my brother says he's William to, willing to um, try to answer your questions. So Al asks him some things. And then one of the things he asks is why, you know, I have some clients that I can't figure out why they're not 
connecting with their deceased loved one and and what's going on there and so they do the procedure the guy closes his eyes he poses the question to his brother and then he he's he's still got his eyes closed and he says to al my brother says to tell you that you think you're in charge but we're in charge we decide if we're going to come how we're going to come and it's all based on the well-being of the living person if we think it's not in their best interest we won't we won't come and you won't be able to tell because they look to you like the people who were successful but we have a sense it's not it's not in their best interest right now to have this communication so um it just may be that there is a higher wisdom at work about who has what experience when and that that something that science will never be able to um touch and it truly that truly becomes a matter of faith and that's that's as far as i've gotten on that yeah on that it's just one of those many things that we don't know we can never know we can guess but mm -hmm. let's leave it at that yeah right uh one more thing mm -hmm. um on the out of body experience mm -hmm. and the validity of it um I'm sure you know, so I just want your opinion on the studies of Olaf Blunky. Mm -hmm, right. With, with the God Helmet, I think it was. Yeah. Um, where the lady, I believe she experienced a partial out of body experience, or her leg went up, or a, she sat up. I didn't read it yeah. fully. Um, yeah. But it's been suggested that I ask various people about it because yeah. it's apparently taken as evidence that it's the temporal parietal junction yeah. that, that mm -hmm. causes these experiences. So. Yeah. I actually wrote an article with Jeff Long, um, you know, Jeff Long, yeah. The Near Death Experience about, Research Foundation. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Right, exactly. And we compared the her narrative to a narrative of a near-death experiencer who had, um, you know, kind of some similar features, but the two accounts were extremely different. The, uh, the Blanc patient, um, it was a very, um, uh, um, what's the word, not integrated experience. There was like this, this one aspect where she felt her leg sort of, or she felt herself sitting up when she really wasn't. And as opposed to the integrated experience of a person who has a true out of body or what I call material aspect NDE. Um, and so the, the nature, you know, again, you can stimulate my brain and make my hand go like this, but that's not the same thing as when I do this. And, and that's, that's the difference. Um, you know, you can artificially induce um, hallucinatory experiences, it doesn't mean that the real experiences don't happen. You know, you can, you can stimulate a part of the brain that makes you hear orchestral music. It doesn't mean that when I go to the, the symphony, I'm not really hearing the music, you know? So that's, that's, that's what I think is going on there. And I mean, the experience that they mentioned was at best a partial experience. You know, exactly. These people that have out of body experiences, either in near death experiences or by will, astral projection, um, yeah. they don't often have just a leg or not even, they don't. Did she even see herself sitting up or did she just have the experience of feeling I like she was? I don't remember. It's been a few years. But, but they, they actively you know, see their point of consciousness rising up, their sense of vision behind closed eyes rising up and by will they travel and can see verified things in other countries sometimes right. The, right. as far as i've read so yeah. i don't know if olaf blunk's experiment really suggests that it's all in the mind all in the brain just yeah. from a leg moving up or feeling of sitting exactly. up I, I feel like i'm spinning sometimes when i'm in bed uh -huh. during um i don't know if it's early stages of uh, what's it called Sleep, sleep paralysis. paralysis or whatever, but I often feel like I'm spinning. Mm -hmm. But I know the difference between when I feel like I'm spinning, when I'm actually spinning. Yeah, you know, yeah. 
Exactly. And yeah. I'm sure when this lady woke up, she didn't say I was out of my body. She probably said I felt like I was out of my body. Mm-hmm. But the reports of those that actually do say I was out of my body. Mm-hmm. So there is a very different subjective experience there, I believe. Yeah. I don't know what the woman said, but I'm assuming yeah. it was probably not as vivid. It wasn't. No. It wasn't as vivid. It was partial and, and fragmented. That's the word I was looking for. Her experience was quite fragmented as yeah. opposed to the integrated experience of. Right. Yeah. So I'm not sure if that holds much water, really, to be honest. I don't think it does. No. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not denying that somehow the brain is involved in the the formation of memory of the of the experience and all that. And and I, you know we're back to that second hard problem of how does, how does that all work? Um, But um, just, but the fact that you can artificially induce a fragmented, um, you know, very, a very small fragment of a much bigger experience, you know, when it happens um, like naturally, um is do, it it just doesn't um it doesn't you know again the fact that you can make this happen by stimulating the brain doesn't negate that this is happening by my intention yeah. it doesn't explain the will behind doing it it only explains the mechanism of doing it yeah 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 mm-hmm. so trying to think is there anything else I think we've pretty much covered everything. I think so. We have I, th- I think I think on the on the last thing then to summarise, um, general science and practitioners of the physical sciences will say there is no evidence to suggest that life after death may exist, and that all the evidence we have suggests that when the brain dies, we just experience, or we just don't experience anymore which in itself is very, very difficult to conceptualise. Um, and that's the position of, of you know, very noble science, scientists, Brian Cox and um, Sam Harris and various others. Um, so would you then say that, in fact, from a purely scientific, non-biased point of view, the evidence would, in fact, lean to there being some form of survival after death? That's, that's my take on the evidence, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I do really wonder how much, I wonder how many near-death experiencers, after-death communicators, um, and p- other transpersonal experiencers, those people have actually talked to. You know, I think it's very, well, just to throw in one more thing, you know, there's um, Susan Blackmore suggested that um, when people in near-death experiences see a tunnel of light, that's actually their, the, when the, when uh, blood is um, no longer occurring, being yeah. circulated, you know, the visual field narrows and closes. And she said, that's what's really causing it. So I had a colleague one day at a, at a social event, tell me that he had had a near-death experience involving a tunnel. He had had an after-death communication experience involving a tunnel, the same tunnel, he said. And he also was a Korean War pilot who had experienced yeah. G-lock, which is the, you know, the... Um, it occurs during anoxia, doesn't it? Yes, exactly. Yeah. They um, the the way that they induce it artificially is through a centrifugal machine that pulls the blood out of the brain, and then the person loses consciousness. But the point being that he had experienced that narrowing of the visual field from blood, you know, because of gravitational force, and um, and he also had an NDE and an ADC that included a tunnel. So I did a case study on him, and I had him, for example, complete the near-death experience scale for his G-lock experience. The Grayson scale. Yes, uh uh-huh. 
Yeah, it's the that's right. Um, Bruce Grayson's near death experience scale. Yeah, for the GLOC, the NDE, and the ADC, and in uh, for the GLOC, it he he scored two or three points, and you need seven for it to be considered a bona fide near death experience. Yeah. yeah, and for the um, NDE, I think he scored like 11 and the ADC scored like 18. The Good. ADC well, was actually yeah. more intense than the, than the NDE itself. But both of them, you know, exceeded the criterion. And then I did a qualitative interview and asked him to compare the narrowing of the visual field with the tunnel. And essentially the tunnel in the two transpersonal experiences was virtually identical. It, it um, had a warm welcoming quality to it it was um uh the it was extremely bright and the glock experience had no emotional quality at all and it wasn't bright in fact it was you know the the a visual field darkens same sort of thing that happens when you faint which unfortunately yeah. i've had the experience of it's not uh, very nice at all it certainly doesn't yeah. encompass feelings of love no or no feelings of yeah, panic right. Yeah. So, so I think that armchair theorists can sit back and say, oh, they see a tunnel because their visual field is closing down due to lack of oxygen to the brain. But when you actually talk to somebody who's experienced, you know, both, they say, no, these are completely different experiences. And I think, so when I, when I hear about, um, people who are quite adamant that there's no survival of consciousness after death and all that. I wonder how many people have they talked to? Have they had experiences themselves? And, um, you know, there's a gal in um, Sydney, Australia, who did her doctoral thesis on um, a qualitative study of about 35 adults who had had experienced after death communication. And she found that they fell into two categories. Either before their ADC, they may have, if they believed in the survival of consciousness after death, the ADC just confirmed their belief. If before the ADC, they didn't believe in the survival of consciousness after death, a um, great majority of them, like almost everybody after the ADC, now believed in the survival of consciousness after death. So there's no substitute for direct experience, and um, and um, and I just really wonder. And I think the nearest substitute to direct experience is to interview, not just read, but interview a lot of people who've had these experiences, and then this their sincerity and the the holistic impression of what they're conveying about the nature of consciousness and life and death really um, can take shape, take form. So, um, so I, just, I just really wonder. Mm. And I mean, as you say, the armchair theorists and the armchair skeptics, it, it's fair enough that you come to that view without looking into it because anybody would. Yeah. But the, the damage comes when you're a popular armed armchair theorist mm -hmm. with many people who follow you and mm -hmm. you're giving information without that knowledge without that willingness to find the knowledge right and influencing yeah. these other people who will then go onto the internet and tell other people they're crazy and yeah. it creates this snowball effect in the position we are now it does yeah and it's a shame it, it surprises me sorry i just before i forget it surprises me with susan blackmore because she had an experience didn't she on was it lsd i don't remember but, yeah, but I know she did have an experience. Yeah, so yeah. she she must have been one of the majority uh, minority that didn't come out believing, mm -hmm. and she right. actually said it to you that her research proved the opposite. Uh huh. So I yeah. wonder why that is. I don't know about. I mean, I know that she argues the opposite, but I don't know that she has actually done research that confirms the opposite. I okay. I know. Um, yeah. I, I know that she um, takes that. And I, I heard one other case of a person who had uh, an NDE who just really couldn't accept it. 
you know, just they're they're so steeped in the materialist worldview that that they just couldn't accept even their own direct experience. But that's pretty rare, in I think. Yeah, at least it's rare in terms of you know I've probably read and talked with over a thousand near death experiencers now, and and I don't run into that hardly at all. Mm-hmm. Experience is very so persuasive. Less than ten percent of people also. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One last question. I think I better ask it because it's one of the most popular counter arguments. Um, mm-hmm. Why, if, if if these outward experiences and near death experiences have, have veridical perception, and some people can do them at will, as they claim, why has no one won that James Randi million dollar challenge? Um. What is his challenge? I read it, but I it's forgot. um. So James Randi is obviously the amazing Randi, very good conjurer. Uh, he started up the, 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 the um, James Randi Educational Foundation, which offers a million dollars to anybody that can demonstrate under their conditions um, verifiable paranormal phenomena. Uh-huh. And apparently nobody's um, been able to do that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know very much about that. Um, but. Um... I yeah I don't know. You don't know. I don't know how to answer that. No, it is a difficult one. I mean, several people have said that he's not particularly honest. That they keep raising the level of the bar. I've never spoken to the bloke or anybody that represents him, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's just a very. I just thought I'd ask. It's a very very common counter argument that no one's done it, therefore it's all fraud, etc. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah. I uh, I just I haven't. Um, I guess that's something that I haven't put my energy into understanding because, you know, there is research in the paranormal domain, uh, the sheep goat effect. Do you, do you know this where um, uh, they've had um, two groups of scientists do the same study on a paranormal phenomenon and one group are non-believers and the other group are believers and the believers actually get statistically significant results and the non-believers don't it's like the attitude it's it gets into a kind of quantum physics kind of thing where conscious intention um influences the outcome and if i were a person who had this ability i don't know that i would want to subject myself to the attitude of randy and that um, that even my abilities might be um, hampered in some way by that negative attitude, and so it's um, it's it's sort of a dilemma. Yeah, as I say, I've never spoken to James Rand or anyone that represents him, so I can't fairly say whether he's yeah. a con man or whether he's genuinely very good at this. But from my view, he's a conjurer not a scientist yeah. to begin with yeah um uh-huh. and that's known but as i say i can't fairly comment on the, on the guy he's probably a very very nice bloke i've never spoken with him there's just yeah. a, from what i've heard he's su- suggests he's not as genuine mm. as, as people believe mm. but again i don't know mm. so yeah i won't make any know. comment on that and i, I would say you know it's just it's very hard for um people who have adopted who have really taken a position to accept evidence to the contrary. I don't know if you've heard of Michael Shermer's mm-hmm. uh, experience. Oh, his experience, probably with, not. Yeah, he um, uh, was getting married and his, and they were getting, they, the wedding was taking place at his home where he and his fiance lived. And his fiance's grand, his fiance, had been raised or been very close to her grandfather when she was growing up and the grandfather had passed. So a few months before, a couple months before the wedding, um, the uh, fiance received a box of her grandfather's things and included in it was a transistor radio, a transistor radio, you know, from way back. And so Michael was really, 
interested in this and he tried to get it to work and he just couldn't. So he stuck it in a drawer in the back of the house and the wedding day comes. And um, as they're preparing for the ceremony, um, his fiance says, you know, I, I really would like to talk with you inside the house for a minute. And so they step inside and she said, I just want you to know that I'm really, really missing my grandfather right now. I so wish he were here to, um, to you know, to be part of our wedding. And just then they heard music from the back of the house. And they're like, what is that? And they followed the sound and opened the drawer and the transistor radio was playing. And so even that doesn't convince Shermer that, um, that there could be survival of consciousness after death. You know, that the possibility that her grandfather was signaling to her, I, I am here, I'm watching, I'm, I'm part of this, I'm with you. Um, so um, it's just really hard when, you know, something even statistically off the charts like that, you know, where he himself couldn't get the transistor radio to work and then it suddenly plays, her grandfather's transistor radio suddenly plays when she's telling Michael how much she miss, misses her grandfather. You know, it, um, it's just really hard. It is. I mean, the, the difficulty with electronic phenomena like that is that in electronics, you do get glitches and things that happen off right. the cuff. Again, very, very low chance of that happening, but it's possible. Right. Um, it is. It is. And and that's where, you know, it, again, when you get to the um, the reflective judgment, you know, quasi-reflective would say, well, there's always a chance that it was just this weird, you know, but then if you have to keep saying there was this highly improbable thing that happened and then it happened again and again and again and again, it gets to the point of really um, yeah. defying it's logic. Very grasping at straws to say that every yeah. time. I think the problem yeah. is with coincidences, whenever a coincidence happens, if, if you're going to say the same thing, it's very, very, very unlikely. But then yeah. coincidences do happen. Yeah. And of course, every time you have one, you're going to say that. So whether things yeah. are okay, but it's just to what extent that would have to be possible yeah. to determine whether it would be coincidence or not. Something yeah. as specific as some of the coincidences, coincidences that you hear mm -hmm. would be would have to be very, very, very in place. All the planets would have to align for it to happen. Yeah. You know, yeah. And that's, that's when you have to start to think. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I had the feeling once suddenly that I had to take a picture of my grandmother and I'll tell you another one as well in a minute um, but I had a very small feeling that I had to take a picture of my grandmother for no reason um, and I took a picture of her uh, and then a couple of months later she was diagnosed with cancer and died of it I would say that's coincidence I wouldn't say that's at the realms of possibility and mm -hmm. I wouldn't I certainly wouldn't jump to paranormal with that um, mm -hmm. another one I was at work and I was making um, phone packaging for for boxes where you put monitors and printers in them and uh, there was a little butterfly, and I hadn't seen any butterflies around, but this was just after my nan had died. And there was a little butterfly flying around, and it came and settled on my workbench. Um, and there was an electronic saw there and a you know, hot glue gun, and it was somewhere that you wouldn't expect a butterfly to be with the sound. I had to wear ear projectors. Um, it wasn't on the saw, but this, this butterfly came down and settled down and didn't move. And I thought, what's going on with that butterfly? I just sat there, and another guy came up who I worked with, and I said, hey, look at this butterfly. And he wasn't moving. He went up and he poked it, and it just sort of flopped over. He said, "That's in dead." He said, you know, "That's a shame." So I just left him there, and uh, I went to pick him up, and all of a sudden he got up and flew off. Uh -huh. And this was just after my—I think it was about a week or two after my nan died. Don't quote me on that. I'm not totally sure. It was a long time ago. Yeah. But I just thought that was unusual. Again, mm -hmm. possibly a coincidence. It's not out of the realms of possibility. But I've never seen a butterfly do that and let itself be touched. Wasn't yeah. it? wasn't in the hibernation season, you wouldn't have seen it. And yeah. if it was asleep, I mean, I, I know they do stop and they sleep like that. Mm -hmm. But when someone pokes it and it falls over, wouldn't it wake up then? You know? Yeah, yeah. But that was just something that, that made me think, eh, maybe yeah. man has been influencing that butterfly or, or something. But little things like that, you know, again, not out of the realms of coincidental possibility, but it's more out of the range than me taking a picture of me then, you know, something yeah. that makes you think.
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I have a butterfly ADC as well. Um, and again, just illustrating the unlikelihood of the alignments of events, um, my husband's, uh, well, I'll start with my husband and his friend John and I were sitting at our uh, kitchen table uh, one Sunday evening talking about um, our parents. And we were talking about how Gary's mother, and her name is Aline, um, was beginning to decline cognitively. And we were thinking we were going to maybe have to try to move her to a nursing home and she wouldn't want any of that. While we're having this conversation, I had this sense up in near the ceiling of um, irony. I don't know how to explain this any different, but there was a sense up there of irony that we were talking about this. And I, I noticed it, but I didn't say anything because how do you even say, yeah. you know, while we're talking about this, I have the sense of irony up near the ceiling. Yeah. Um, it's like the saying, I have a sense of happiness over by the swimming pool. Yeah, um, right. What do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the next morning, I was in my home office seeing a client, in, a counseling client, and I heard the telephone ring out in, in the main part of our house. I heard my husband answer the phone, and I heard him burst into tears, which I've been, we've been together over 20 years. This is the only time I've ever heard this. So my client wasn't in crisis or anything, so I said, do you excuse me for a minute? And the client's like, yeah. So I go out and learn that um, they had just found Aline's body. She had been showering the previous morning and she slipped and fell in the bathtub, hit her head and died. So at the time that we were having that conversation on Sunday night about having to move Aline to a, that's what the irony was. She was there. I had the sense she was there. And saying, you know, like, y'all don't need to worry about this yeah. anymore. I'm, yeah. I'm done, you know. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, and this, this uh, was your mother-in-law, sorry, was it? My mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. So about a week or two later, we were uh, at her house with Gary's sister, Babs, and we were cleaning out the house. And I should say that uh, because this was such a shock, she died suddenly. Gary's aunt invited us to come and stay with her during the funeral preparations and all that. So we were there for like three days and she took such good care of us. So a couple of weeks later, we were cleaning out Aline's house and Aline had these canisters with a monarch butterfly on the front. And I, I said to Babs, would you mind if I take one of these? It's gonna break up the set, but it would be just perfect to clean this out, put potpourri in it, and give it to Gary's aunt as a thank you gift because she would recognize this was from Aline's house. Mm. It would match her bathroom. Yeah, it should be a nice memorial for her. Nice mm. memorial. So sure, Bev said fine. So I did all that. Gave Aline uh, a couple weeks later. Gave her the potpourri and um, and she placed it in the bathroom. Uh, a little bit after, and just like you, I don't know if it was maybe a week later or something like that. I'm standing at my back window, sipping tea, looking out the window in the morning, and I notice in our ivy patch that there's a monarch butterfly. Oh, let me let me say this too. At Aline's funeral, I had taken one flower from each of the flower arrangements and tied them together and brought them home and hung them in our bedroom, a dried flower arrangement. Yeah. So I'm, I'm standing at the back window looking out, I see this monarch butterfly and, I, and I'm watching it, watching it, and it's just barely moving. And then I'm, I realized after some time that it was moving only when the trees moved from the breeze, like it was not moving of its own accord. So I went out and gingerly, you know, and so long story short, I finally reached down and touched it and then picked it up and it was this perfect, dead butter, monarch butterfly with its antennae still in place. And I brought it in the house and put it with the flowers. And um, never in my life before or since have I found a perfect dead monarch butterfly. But it was the same butterfly that was on the front of the canister that I gave Gary's aunt. So, you know, how, what are, what's the likelihood? 
that that, you know, and um, I very definitely believe that that was a, a mm. message from her. Of course, there are a, lot you know, of, a lot of people argue that that is coincidence. It's not unheard of. Yeah, they they but, can argue know, that they want. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't make any difference, no. It's, no. Especially it's, it's the only one you've ever seen in your life and it happened to be after this moment, yeah. Exactly, I mean, right. The, the only other after-death communication I can think of that I know of in our family is my mum. Her nan died. Um, and she was the only one that was really very close to her. And one night she was at, at home, which is now my nan's house. Uh, she was, I can't remember how old she was, about eight or nine. So you could argue memory over time changing a little but she says she still remembers it now as clearly as it was uh, which is often the case and she yeah. was she was lying in bed and my man she always had the heat up but always had always had she's still alive uh, she always has the heat up very high and she feel, she'd always feel the, the cold so it'd always be in the in the 20s mm -hmm. celsius i don't know what that is in fahrenheit there's mm -hmm. one just like me being young it's on that system celsius yeah. um okay. Anything. but it was hot and mum -hmm. was lying in bed thinking about her and then thinking you know i wish that she'd give me something so i know she's all right she wasn't allowed to go to a funeral mm -hmm. because her dad said she was too young for that sort of stuff so she really regretted not being able to say that last goodbye at the funeral mm -hmm. but she said she was thinking you know i wish i could have gone i'm sorry man please i wish you'd let me know that you're okay and she said this room went freezing cold again she the man keeps it very very hot she said it went freezing cold and she saw the light move sort of swing huh. and it's a it's just a standard kind of lampshade and it should start to, to swing mm -hmm. and she said you know she was thinking this is nan this must be nan and she said out loud you know thanks nan i know you're okay thanks for letting me know and the temperature went back to normal the light stopped and mm -hmm. she went to sleep now mm -hmm. I, I tried you know saying everything you know well my third first thing that came to my mind was hypnagogic hallucination. You're about to fall off to sleep and you mm -hmm. see this move. I've seen things move when I've been on the verge of life. I've never been there, luckily, but when yeah. I've been on the verge of wakefulness and sleep. And I said, yeah, that happens. She said, mm -hmm. no, I was fully awake. I was nowhere near sleep. I was completely awake. So I said, right, well, this was, you know, you were, you were eight, you're now 40, whatever she was when I asked her first. That was 30, 40 years ago. Are you remembering it correctly? Maybe your maybe the memory's been been awkward over the years. No, uh, this is definitely how it happened. What it was like. You know what Nan's house is like. It's always hot. I said, it bloody well is always hot. I know mm -hmm. that for a fact. Um, she said it went freezing cold. I said, yeah, that, that doesn't make sense, does it? She said, no. So mm -hmm. that was an interesting one for me. That's the first one I've, I've really heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, there's no reason that light would move if she wasn't on the verge of. of Away from us and sleep, said she was wide awake, but the temperature suddenly dropping like that and then going back to normal mm -hmm. is a good one for me. Yeah, it is. Yeah, mm. yeah, that's really interesting. So, is a nan a grandmother? Grandmother, sorry, yeah. Okay, yeah. Nan, yeah. Forget we're in different countries, aren't we? Yeah, that's okay. That's good yeah. to know. That <laughs> yeah, um, whenever an English person says nan, they mean grandmother. Yeah. Grandmother, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I've had I've had several after death communication experiences and um, and and from studying them, I know that they um, like near death experiences, the memory of them doesn't degrade over time. They remain just as vivid for people years, decades mm -hmm. later. Yeah. It's almost, as if, it's almost as if that memory has touched your higher consciousness if we theorize yeah. that it exists it's almost as if it's touched the height and it, the memory is therefore more pure and not filtered yeah, so i wonder that's if that's something right. to do with it yeah um, have you ever mm -hmm. had any uh, reports or experiences yourself of after this communication from animals pets i haven't but i know people who have um my friend mary joe her husband died of a heart attack and um about a year before he died, he had retired and his faculty as a retirement gift had given him a puppy. So he'd had this dog with him for like a year and a half. Um, it was his companion and then and then he died. So- um, After a year and a half. After a year and a half, so yeah. That's young, isn't it? 
Yeah. Uh, no, I don't mean the dog. I mean the man. Oh, um, the man died. The man died. Oh, yeah. I see. Right, uh -huh. right, right, right. And Mary Jo still had the dog. So um, it, I think it was a few days after Daryl's funeral that Mary Jo was getting ready for bed one night and the dog ran into the uh, bedroom and hopped up on the bed and, and went like this and looked up and Mary Jo looked up and there was this like green sort of orb. It was like a, it didn't have a defined, it was like a glow, a green glow. And, um, and then the dog jumped off the bed ran out and she's like, and then ran back in and jumped back on the bed and dropped his favorite toy. Like he wanted, you know, like, like he wanted, play. wanted that to throw and, in, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and Mary Jo said they both were looking at this light and then it just disappeared. And so, um, and she said, then she looked at the dog and she's like, the dog just deflated, you know, and then hopped off the bed and slowly walked and she followed it and walked to its bed and got into bed and went to sleep. So, um, so the dog was perceiving, she believed that that was Daryl and the dog was perceiving Daryl's presence. Yeah. And they say that um, animals and children are very in tune with that. Yeah, yeah. can be, can be uh, perceptive. Um, but then people have seen pets in after death communication um, and uh, I have a, I lead a group that meets once a month for people who've had near death experiences or who have personal or professional interest in them or anything related to them. And um, her dog died. And she said one day she was vacuuming and she vacuuming through the house and she vacuumed this one room and then closed the door and continued vacuuming on. And then she and she was alone in the house and she came back and opened the door and started to walk in and saw that in the middle of the room, the carpet was like torn up and which is what her dog used to do. And so she really believed that mm -hmm. it was the dog kind of sending a message. So it, it seems then that um, and there's been other evidence for it. But again, it's often seen as it can't happen. But it seems that, I mean, even in the spiritual community, it's seen that it can't happen, that spirits can interact with the physical in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, was, I, yeah. I see a lot of near-death experiences who've had experiences say that that can't happen because it's two different dimensions. Of course, the skeptics mm -hmm. say it can't happen full stop, so we ignore that for now. But even the spiritual people say it can't happen because they're two different levels. But it seems that there are experiences that indicate that maybe it can. Yeah, well, I certainly think... Uh, I've read a couple of books by men whose wives died with whom they had extensive after-death communication. These are two men who don't know each other at all. But in the communication with their deceased disembodied wives, um, there's an interesting parallel of information that, that, uh, that they perceived. And in both cases, the wives said that um, it that when we're disembodied, we we transform energetically to a higher energy state, and so it is difficult to interact with the material world because we're energetically so much like lower. Yeah, and More so things. they they talk about uh, how their wives actually um, um, develop their ability to communicate. That the, and one of the guy's wives said, okay, the easiest thing for me to do is to mess up electronics, you know, to make lights flash, lights go out, you know, um, that kind of thing. Um, then it's more of an effort for me to put a thought, you know, communicate thoughts with you and have mind-to-mind -mind communication. It's even more effort for me to manifest physically. And so, and um, it took her time to cultivate these abilities. But even when she developed the ability to appear to him, which she did a, a few times, 
um, she only did it a few times and and just talked about how much effort it took to lower her vibration enough to make that happen. So I wonder if it's I wonder if it's similar to us as human beings and possibly animals, I don't know, but us as human beings attaining a higher level of consciousness through years of meditation, it's not mm -hmm. easy to astral project or in, infer an out of body experience. That's right. the wrong word, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah. So I wonder if it's the same kind of practice in us uh, heightening our vibration to achieve these levels as it is for them to lower in a same similar sort of practice. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's my impression. Mm -hmm. It certainly can happen, apparently. Uh, do you know about the skull experiments? I'm, I'm sure you probably do. Oh, mm -hmm. oh, that's a good one to look into. It's, it's It'd take a long time to explain. But it's essentially the only study that's taken place between mediums and scientists, and I think external observers as well, that have had peer-reviewed objective evidence from mediumship experiences, where spirits came through. There was uh, the, the one that's most talked about during the skull experiments was they had a blank film disc, film roll, before it was all digital. I think this was many years ago. Um, but they had a blank film disc unsealed and signed by one of the scientists and then this film disc was put into a container i think it was locked it might not have been but the important thing is that it was unsealed and it was signed um then the lights were turned off completely because apparently the spirit said they couldn't operate unless it was very dark don't know why but that's what they said um and then after the session they were able to open the box. It was still signed and still completely sealed. Uh, they took out the, the disc and pictures appeared on it of apparently portraits of these spirits and other things. Mm. And it seemed unlikely that these would have been on there originally before it was sealed because it was sealed by the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. So, And they say it was blank. I'm taking their word for it, but I'd assume yeah. it would be. Mm -hmm. And that was the main one, but there is a lot of things that happened physically in the sky. But I'd say if you if you ever got time, look at it because it's very yeah. very interesting. And how do you spell skull? S S C O L E. S C O L E. Okay, yeah, great. It's I a it. it's a village or a town, I think, in in England where it took place. Oh, okay. And the, yeah. it, you may have picked up when you started to talk about this and said it's the only peer reviewed um, evidence. You may have noticed my face looking surprised and that's because uh there's been a lot of peer-reviewed research on mediumship by gary schwartz yes and um by the um winbridge institute or winbridge um um why am i, I blanking on her name i haven't looked much into i've heard of his work but uh, i haven't looked much into it so i, I don't know oh julie by shell Right. Um, I highly recommend that you do look into it because sh she's done a lot of research and I have the greatest respect for her as a scientist. What's, what's her name? Julie? Yeah, Julie, and it's B-E-I-S-C-H-E-L. Julie Boyshell. And uh, Windbridge is the name of her um, organization. Wind, Windbridge. Wind, Windbridge, one word. Mm -hmm. Windbridge. Brilliant. Yeah. I'll have a look yeah. at that. Yeah. Great.